All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to the webinar of Housing First as a Key Strategy to End the HIV Epidemic. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Alice Douglas, Director of Learning Collaboratives for CAI, and I'm so happy to welcome you and get us started. As many of you likely know, Housing First is an effective, cost-efficient, evidence-based practice that demonstrates improved health outcomes and care utilization for people experiencing homelessness. And the, U <clears throat> and the U.S. ending the HIV epidemic is a unique opportunity for HRSA-funded jurisdictions to support the uptake and implementation of the Housing First model in their own communities. We are excited to do a deeper dive into the Housing First model with you today and bring you panelists who have promoted a Housing First approach in their jurisdictions. We first want to acknowledge that our project is funded by HRSA's HIV AIDS Bureau to provide technical assistance to the 47 prioritized jurisdictions also funded by HAP to implement an EHE plan for their jurisdiction. CAI's Technical Assistance Provider Innovation Network, or TAP-IN, provides technical assistance to the 47 jurisdictions funded to implement Ending the HIV Epidemic, EHE, plans under the Ryan White HIV AIDS program. We support jurisdictions to achieve the ambitious EHE goal of a reduction of 90% in new HIV infections by 2030. Back to you, Alice. Thank you, Brooke. So for today's webinar, um, we have uh, the following folks as moderators and presenters, myself and my colleague, Margaret Haffey, the manager of learning collaboratives at CAI, and our good friends and colleagues from Housing Works, Jenny Schubert, Ken Robinson, and Aliza McKenna. Um, on today's agenda, we hope to cover the importance for housing for people living with HIV, as well as providing an introduction to the Housing First model. We also are gonna take some time to think about how do we make a housing first approach actionable and then hear from our panel discussion who've put this to action in their own jurisdictions. We're gonna end the learning uh, today's webinar with an opportunity um, to, to join our next Housing as Healthcare Learning Community and then close out with evaluations and next steps. All of this in hopes of meeting the following objectives. So by our hope is by the end of this webinar, you will be able to describe a housing first approach, articulate the evidence base for housing first as a best practice, and list three ways a housing first approach could be promoted by an EHE jurisdiction. So to get us started, I'm going to now hand this over to Jenny Schubert um, to describe the importance of housing for people living with HIV. Jenny? Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, and thanks for joining us. And I have a feeling that you wouldn't be on this call if you didn't already understand the tremendous importance of housing as a critical enabler uh, for man effectively managing HIV infection. Um, let me just say at the outset, I have no doubt that we will end our HIV epidemic in the US. And I have no doubt that housing and food and other social determinants are going to be a key part of that. So we're happy to be talking about that today. You can move the slide on. People have seen a lot of this evidence. There's a citation later to um, a pretty thorough um, uh, uh, review of the literature. It's no doubt from all the evidence that um, housing uh, or a lack of stable housing undermines almost every aspect of effective HIV care. And the word I want to emphasize here is independent, because if you control for substance use, mental health care, uh, other factors that we know that can um, affect uh, the effectiveness of antiretroviral therapy, um, we find that housing status, poor housing status, lack of safe, safe housing has an independent effect, that it is alone impacting uh, everything from delayed entry to care to premature mortality. Next slide. The good news, though, is that uh, a, a review of the literature shows that when you address housing instability with housing assistance, um, outcomes vastly improve. Um, people are able to adhere to heart. Um, they are able to vastly reduce 
uh, expensive and unavoidable and avoidable inpatient and emergency care. And one study that always sticks with me in San Francisco is that among a group of folks who were homeless at the point they were diagnosed with AIDS in a five-year period, those who got stable housing had an 80% lower chance of mortality over the five-year period. Next slide, please. So even though we have all the strong evidence, as you all know, because you do housing, uh, we just don't have the resources to meet the need. And so this statistic comes from a, a, an analysis of one of the medical monitoring report surveys that the CDC does regularly of all um, people with living with HIV across the country. So th this kind of data gives us better information even than our Ryan White data because we know that not everyone is engaged in our Ryan White programs. And shockingly, what this study found was that, I think this was in 2019, one in five of all people with HIV they surveyed had had one, at least one experiences, experience of homelessness or housing instability in the 12 months part of the interview. Interestingly, whether you were doubled up on your parents' couch or you were moving frequently or you were literally homelessness, homeless, they saw the same poor health outcomes as a result of housing instability. And I just wanna take a minute here and explain why we're talking so much about housing first, because these figures are bad enough. But among priority populations who, because of systemic racism and marginalization, are more likely to experience both homelessness and poor HIV health outcomes, the same study found that uh, Black Americans, even though they were only 14% of the population, uh, were 40% of all people in the country experiencing homelessness and 42% of new HIV diagnosis. Young people with HIV had 32% of young people with HIV had had at least one experience of homelessness in the past year. Similarly, 28% of transgender women and a shocking 46% of people with HIV who were injection drug users have been homeless in the past year. So we've got to find housing programs that work. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, we're going to give you a quick introduction into Housing First. I know a lot of people think they know what Housing First is, but we just want to dive a little deeper and talk about it in a little more detail. So um, next slide. We're gonna have a little word cloud um, uh, that Alice is gonna monitor for us and just get a sense of what people think Housing First might be. Great, yes, so as Jenny indicated, we wanna do a brief temperature check um, and we're gonna use Poll Everywhere to do that. So if we go to the next slide, we're gonna ask you all to either join by the web, join by text, or join by the QR code using your phone. Just point it right at the screen. Um, and we would like for you to think about and enter, when you think about Housing First model, what word or words come to mind? As a note, if you are going to put multiple words in, uh, link them with a hyphen so that the full thought will show up on screen and so they don't get broken up into uh, two different two different thoughts. Um, so I know Janae has placed that in the chat um, and we're gonna give you just a few moments to respond. Um, great, Brooke has pulled this up. We see it changing in real time. I love this. Positive, right? housing. <laughs> I see everyone in there, which I really like to see. Immediate wraparound services, because we know it's not housing only, it's housing first. No barriers for clients. Safety. That's so important. All right, I'm going to give about two more seconds for folks to enter any last 
thoughts? All right, unencompassing. That's interesting. I think I, I think Jenny would like to unpack a lot of these uh, in, in her uh, conversation. So I'm going to now turn it back to Jenny um, to provide a little bit more of an overview about the Housing First model, given that we see that you all have a little bit of an understanding and we can definitely dive deeper. Yeah, so I think people are have a pretty good sense of Housing First. You know, as HUD defines it, it's a person-centered harm reduction framework for ending homelessness that prioritizes placement in stable housing as an essential foundation for, for pursuing other health and social goals. That's a pretty good definition. Um, it's often described in terms of rapid placement and permanent, permanent housing, but you can also take a housing first approach to transitional housing, emergency housing. What you're really talking about is removing barriers to stability. And um, so I think it's important that housing first can be applied not just to programs, but to an overall community approach. I'll just mention here that it's endorsed by the VA. It's considered a best practice by HRSA and HUD. It's required for the HUD continuum of care programs um, and, uh, and also by many uh, local uh, housing funders. And ultimately, as we've already discussed, it's absolutely essential if we're going to meet the needs of people that typically bounce off of conditioned housing programs. So let's go to the next slide. So this sounds great, but does it actually work? And the good news is that there is a growing and pretty strong um, uh, body of research that shows that when you compared, when you compare housing first, low threshold, harm reduction models of care to treatment first approaches where you have to achieve sobriety or something else before you're considered housing ready. Um, treatment uh, Housing first programs produce much better outcomes. Just in terms of people with HIV, one comparison showed that there was a greater increase in viral load. There are lower mortality rates. Uh, people's mental health improves. Um, they, Healthcare costs go down because there are less emergency department and inpatient stays. And you know what? It's not really rocket science. The fundamental point of Housing First is you treat people with dignity and respect, and you give them an opportunity to make choices for themselves. And you know, the funny thing is that what the what the literature shows is that people realize faster improvements and improvements that are long lasting. And it's not that surprising. Next um, slide. So I've already said that there are different levels of housing first at the program level. And we'll go into this a little bit more. Um, it's acceptance without preconditions. At the community level, though, which I think is equally important, it's making sure that there are safe, low threshold, emergency and transitional options so that no one is excluded from a place to live because they're not sober or they're not adhering to their uh, medication. Let's go to the next level. Next slide. This is a great graphic that CIA came up with for uh, just really explaining housing first in, in, in the most fundamental way. I mean, I think anybody who was faced with these, these obstacles, sobriety, employment, program participation, um, especially if you're from a group that's already experienced pretty profound stigmatization um, in service settings, um, you're just not gonna, you're not gonna make it. Um, and so I think uh, what Housing First does and what's fundamental to it is that it affords that respect and safety that people need in order to move forward. Next slide. So um, we're going to go through the fundamental aspects or principles of Housing First. And again, forgive me if you're familiar with them already, but it starts with the 
principle that everyone is housing ready. There's no one who's not housing ready. Um, the difficulty we find in many of our systems is that our programs are not consumer ready. They either don't have the staff or the training or the understanding to work with people that are struggling with many layers of stigma, mar marginalization, uh, long histories of homelessness, et cetera. So next slide. The second principle, and this isn't always in our hands, is that um, admission policy should be uh, streamlined and they should have minimal barriers. And this might mean putting in place systems that help people overcome utility arrears or, uh, or felony convictions. But the real point here is, especially with the things that we can control, um, no, uh, requirements of sobriety, no requirements that you have completed a treatment program or a transitional program. Keep those uh, barriers to entry really minimalized. Next, next slide. Oh, and I should have said before, you know, reconditioning housing on income or the ability to earn income uh, or past convictions. Those are all barriers that we can overcome. Um, third core principle. Yes, of course, there are services. This is one of the fundamental misunderstandings about housing first. You don't just throw somebody in an apartment and walk away and say, good luck. Um, you are always constantly and actively op offering services uh, for people to deal with the many traumas, stigma, marginalization, healthcare, mental health, behavioral health needs that they may have. Uh, but you want to make sure that these services are focused on sustaining their housing. That's your primary goal. Keep that person in housing. And then if they can sustain that housing and stay out of homelessness, then they can start to work on other goals that they may have for themselves, their families, et cetera. Next. Again, as I just said, um, the fourth principle is that you never go away. Support services should always emphasize engagement, but they should always be voluntary. So you don't walk away when somebody rejects uh, a particular service. And motivational interviewing is a very useful tool in this context. And having clinical supervision is very important in these contexts. So you're constantly re-engaging with the client um, informally, formally, um, through case management visits to demonstrate that you care, that you don't have judgments, that you're not gonna be subjecting that person to stigmatizing situations, uh, but you try always to stay uh, engaged. Okay, next. Next slide. So a non-authoritarian uh, approach to service delivery recognizes that service needs vary from time to time um, and you wanna be respectful of what people feel that they want and need. Um, but also you wanna stay focused on how can I keep this person housed? How can I help them live the best life that they can? And for many, abstinence is never gonna be the objective. Substance use is part of some people's lives. Mental health issues are part of some people's lives. So what are you doing to help them manage their issues in a way that, that keeps them housed, keeps them as a good neighbor, and avoids kicking them out of this new safety that they that they found. And I think Hopple really focuses on this. It was being mentioned the other day in another program. Um, housing practices and policies are always designed to prevent eviction. That can mean going through several layers of uh, disciplinary proceedings. Um, problem-solving strategies, behavioral plans, plans for paying past due rent, um, 
And then ultimately, of course, a threat of eviction is even sometimes used effectively uh, to get somebody's attention and get them to agree uh, to uh, to a plan. But even the threat of eviction is a form of engagement um, that you use to try to come to a problem solving uh, solution uh, with someone. So next slide. In summary, you know, we really believe that every person has a right to stable, respectful housing and to services that are delivered with the least amount of trauma and stigma. And this housing first approach, we really believe is a core component because this is how we reach the folks that are most marginal to care, that have been most excluded from care. Um, and as you can see, it has all these benefits. Um, it empowers clients to live their best lives. Um, it keeps them engaged in care. And for, you know, our health economists and naysayers, it's also cheaper than leaving them out on the street and homeless. Um, so I think at this point, I am passing it over to Elise who's gonna give us a few examples and let us think about what is housing first. Thank you so much, Denny. Now we want to test your knowledge a little bit about housing first. For this portion of the segment, we're gonna present you with some fictional housing programs, one at a time. And we want you to decide based on the information given if this housing program is a housing first model or not a housing first model. Next slide. Our first fictional housing program is Quimby Street Apartments. This low income housing program requires demonstrated abstinence for 90 days or enrollment in substance use treatment prior to signing a lease. Let's think about whether or not this is a model of housing first. So the poll reads, is this a housing first model? Yes, this is a housing first model or no, this is not a housing first model. Great, I think we can close the poll. The majority of you are correct. No, this is not a housing first model. And I'm gonna ask Ken Robinson from Housing Works to comment and share a little bit about why this is not a housing first model. So I think, you know, as um, Elise just pointed out, most of you responded correctly on this, but um, the key word here is, um, the program, in quotes, requires demonstrated abstinence. Uh, certainly in the case of substance use, uh, being abstinent is not a requirement. Um, and um, most things that, uh, that you know, people might be dealing with, a lot of the stuff that Jenny alluded to, dealing with anything going on in their lives to mitigate it or to address it as a requirement for housing is not housing work. It's not housing first, rather. Thank you so much, Ken. Let's go to the next one. Let's look at another fictional housing program. Our second housing program is Phoenix Place. This housing unit requires residents to maintain a minimum of 25 hours of employment weekly. Is this a housing first model or not a housing first model? We wanna hear from you in the next poll. The poll reads, is this a housing first model? Yes, this is a housing first model. And no, this is not a housing first model. Great, so the majority of you are correct. This is not a housing first model. Phoenix Place is not a housing first model. I'm gonna ask Ken Robinson to comment on why Phoenix Place is not a housing first model. Well, going back to the previous um, comments that we made, again, requiring 25 hours of employment weekly uh, is not a housing first model because it's required. It may be a great goal. It may be something that makes sense for the person, but uh, that should be something where the uh, staff engage with the person with through uh, motivational interviewing techniques and uh, develop positive rapport with them and uh, let them make their own choices and give them guidance toward it perhaps if, if they're you know if that's what they want but requiring it uh, no matter how important someone may think it is 
uh, is not a housing first model. Thank you so much, Ken. Let's go to our next slide and look at our last case study. Let's take a look at Piper Point Apartments. This low income housing program provides case management and offers residents the opportunity to participate in training in financial management and life skills, as well as referrals to behavioral health care, including a syringe services program. Is this a housing first model? The poll reads, is this a housing first model? Yes, this is a housing first model. Or no, this is not a housing first model. So the majority of you are correct yet again. Yes, this is a housing first model. Piper Point Apartments is a housing first model. And I'm gonna ask Ken Robinson for his commentary on why Piper Point Apartments is a housing first model. Well, the key here is that um, what they describe is offered and made available. Nothing is required. And that goes back to something Jenny was alluding to earlier that I you know, strongly agree with her, that that's a common misperception with uh, housing first, that so you just give them a key and wish them luck. Uh, certainly services are offered. Uh, and we hope to guide the folks to the services they need with uh, client engagement. But yeah, this certainly could be a housing first model here. And I love that it also offers syringe services for the people that want to uh, utilize that. Thank you so much, Ken. And thank you everyone for your participation. I'm gonna to transition to Margaret Happy, who's gonna discuss ways to make a housing first approach actionable in your jurisdiction. Great, thanks so much, Elise. Um, so in this section, we're gonna share some case studies from cohort one participants from the Housing as Healthcare Learning Community. And I'd like to acknowledge that all of our participants in the learning community made really significant strides promoting Housing First in their work. And so we're just gonna highlight a few jurisdictions with innovative ideas. So first we have Tarrant County, which includes the city of Fort Worth, Texas. The Tarrant County, County team is working to update future contract language to not just recommend, but to require subrecipients who provide housing or housing support services use a Housing First approach. This includes creating and providing policies on implementing a housing first approach, both within their health, within their HIV administrative agency, and also for subrecipients, as well as having com conversations uh, now with current subrecipients so they are aware of the plan changes and what those changes mean. On this slide, you see staff in the Broward County team who participated in the first cohort of the Housing and Healthcare Learning Community. Broward County includes the Fort Lauderdale metropolitan area. And in the past year, the Broward County EHE team opened a request for proposals or RFP for organizations in Broward County to provide housing and housing support services to individuals eligible for EHE services. And in this process, the Broward County team prioritized funding for organizations that could demonstrate they currently use a housing first approach in their work. And then the Detroit, Michigan or Wayne County team is taking action to better understand the housing needs of people with HIV in their communities. So they're working with colleagues at the Michigan Department of Health to update data fields in their care work system. So for example, they're seeking to collect more nuanced housing status information, such as if a person is experiencing homelessness, staying at a shelter, if a person's experiencing homelessness and staying on the street or staying with family and friends but then roll into the broader Ryan White program and EHE initiative housing status categories of stable housing, temporary housing, or unstable housing. This more nuanced approach of people's housing status will allow the Detroit team to better understand need and to prioritize support that makes sense for these needs and address gaps in the existing service landscape. In this picture, you see the data analyst and housing coordinator from the Detroit Department of Health a team who participated in cohort one of the housing and healthcare learning community. So we heard earlier that at the program level, housing first means acceptance of residents without preconditions or barriers to entry, such as sobriety or requiring participation in treatment or other services. At the community level, it means making sure that our systems offer safe, low threshold emergency and transitional housing options for vulnerable people who need a place to stay while they work on getting into permanent housing. 
This includes ensuring that funds allocated for housing and housing support services follow a low threshold harm reduction approach where services are offered consistently through participation, though participation is not required, and where housing case management is focused on maintaining housing stability. It also means advancing housing first through Department of Health level policies, as well as supporting community-based organizations and developing and implementing policies that further the housing first model in their organizations. This could include training and education on housing first and what it looks like to implement the model. It could also include collecting information, such as the reason an individual is discharged from a housing program. The reason someone is discharged can help you understand the extent to which a housing first approach is being implemented. So we think it's really important to dig deeper into this housing first approach because to meet the goals of EHE, it's essential to engage and meet the needs of all people with HIV, especially those who face barriers to care that often exclude them from conditioned housing and other health systems. And so now I'm really excited that we're going to hear from colleagues um, at a HRSA-funded EHE jurisdiction as well as at a community-based organization about how they're implementing a housing-first approach. So we'll have them share their experiences, and at the end we'll have a question and answers. And please feel free to submit all your question and answers into the Q&A chat. Okay, so I'm, again, really happy to have three fantastic panelists with us here today to tell us about how they're incorporating Housing First into their work. We'll start by having Michelle, Anna, and Phoebe introduce themselves and tell us respectively about how, about Philadelphia's new housing initiative and Claire Housing. And so to the panelists, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Okay. And I think we'll start with Michelle, Anna, and then Phoebe to introduce themselves. Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Rector, and I am the Housing Program Coordinator for the Division of HIV Health. My experience with Housing First is through training from the Housing Alliance and utilization of the model in conjunction with Radical Customer Service for the past seven years in the shelter system. So by revamping the shelter process and utilization of self-sufficiency model that I developed in 2012, my participants were shown how to design a tool belt that they can use typically they have a, a hammer because everything to them is a nail. So through these workshops and through the Housing First model, we also had an advisory board so that they could actually be inclusive in their journey and establish a solid foundation prior to receiving housing. Thanks so much, Michelle. Anna? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anna Thomas Ferrioli. I'm the EHE or Ending the Epidemic Advisor for um, Philadelphia Department of Public Health and the Division of HIV Health. Um, I was able to participate in, um, in the Housing Lear Learning Collaborative um, this past cycle, and um, we were able to incorporate um, a lot of really great things that we learned um, and ideas that started there into um, our, our housing program that was funded with Ryan White Part B uh, State Rebate Funds. Um, so we're really excited to talk more with, uh, with you about that today. Great. Thanks so much, Anna. We're really happy to have you here. And I'll turn it over to Phoebe. Hi, everybody. My name is Phoebe Trump, or she, her pronouns. And I'm the executive director at Claire Housing. Claire Housing is primarily a housing and services provider, and we're in the Minneapolis St. Paul metro area up here in Minnesota. Um, we've been around for 35 years, and we started during the height of the AIDS epidemic when people were dying and needed a place to be where they could pass away and um, have their loved ones around as they died. So, from that, we really um, changed into a a larger housing provider with multiple different types of housing. And the primary, the primary uh, program we have is our supportive housing apartments, which utilize a low barrier and harm reduction model. So we're really excited to be here today. Terrific, thanks so much. So the first few questions are for Philadelphia, though I invite Phoebe to, to add in um, as she would like. Um, Michelle and Anna, can you tell us a little bit more about how you're supporting the implementation of Housing First in Philadelphia? Oh, and Michelle, Michelle, you're on mute. Thank you. As I stated, um, 
earlier, my experience was being the director of three shelters in Northeast Philadelphia and utilizing the Housing First model. Um, as someone mentioned that Housing First does include shelter and it does include apartments and so forth. So to prepare them, what we had was a, a, a program that allowed them to be inclusive of their process and we allowed them to actually pretty much run the shelter. We had an advisory board um, so that it could say what they liked, what they didn't like, what they want, what they what didn't want. And as long as it didn't interfere with our funder, we were able to allow them to pretty much um, operate the, the shelter itself. Of course, we were there as the rational authority, but if anything transpired, they got to see the advisory board before they came to staff. And that made them able to learn how to um, prepare themselves for when they have their own house and what they're going to allow in to happen there and what they're not going to allow. It also gave them room to grow, um, talk about any traumas they wanted. We had a series of workshops that they could voluntarily attend and we paid them for attending. Now that sounds like a bribe, but you know they got to experience something they may not have ordinarily experienced. And because it was voluntary, when they got to see other people change, which we call in the behavioral health field, phenomenological um, interaction, they said, well, let me try it and see what happens. And before long, mostly everyone that was in shelter was able to um, attend those workshops. And they did very well. And out of 160, I'm sorry, 142 people, we housed 76 people in one year. Wow. That's terrific. That's terrific. That's a lot. And I'm also hearing things that we heard, we learned about earlier about um, individuals having choice and autonomy and self direction. Um, and, and a lot of that, it sounds like, was incorporated into your program. So that, that's fantastic. Um, Anna, why don't you tell us a little bit more about, about how you're supporting the implementation of Housing First and your new initiative? Um, so we're so excited for the new initiative we have uh, we have here in Philadelphia at um, at PDPH. Um, we uh, with uh, with the funds that um, I mentioned earlier from uh, state rebate. Um, this was a significant um, uh, commitment by by the state to uh, housing in the in the city of Philadelphia. Um, they committed. Uh, Two million for the first year um, that is expected to go up to eight million a year in future years. Um, this funding is for transitional housing, um, which was originally, um, you know, is usually characterized as a 24 month time period. Um, but we know we have really severe um, uh, shortage of uh, units. Um, and we know that um, people in permanent housing, especially HAPA funded permanent housing, um, don't leave those units. And are fortunately living like long, healthy lives. And so we have a hop wait, wait list. So we really wanted to be able to have another option that was transitional in nature, but really acknowledge that the transition could be longer. So when we, you know, when we built those contracts with the state, we were able to um, negotiate that um, terms for uh, that uh, someone's assistance would not be discontinued unless they were moving to permanent housing. Uh, so you wouldn't time out of, of this model. Um, so the sort of initial time period is up to 48 months. And um, with with uh, with the caveat and the acknowledgement that no one's housing is going to be discontinued um, just because of time, that they can, that they will, that the goal is permanent housing, but they will, but they will not be uh moved without uh, permanent housing uh, available to them. Um, so that's really one exciting component. We also, in the RFP, wrote directly into the RFP our expectations about Housing First. Um, we we included that any funded program must, um, must follow a Housing First model. Um, we reflected um, and used the definitions that have been adopted by HUD and HAPWA. Um, in, our, in our RFP, we included uh, the um, there's a really great um, HUD and HOP, uh, really great HOPWA uh, two pager um, about ha housing first and um, and uh, harm reduction. So we included that in the reference materials for uh, for the um, RFP um, when uh, so when selecting a program and writing the scope of work. We included language about harm reduction about um, harm reduction and housing first. Um, we also once the contracts are executed and uh, the programs are up and running, will uh, we'll have incorporated um, uh, language about housing first, 
um, assessment about whether Housing First is being followed into um, the uh, program monitoring standards, um, which we will uh, which we will be uh, using to um, to assess the programs and if there's any issues around um, meeting the house, Housing First uh, definition and expectations, we can counsel them um, accordingly. So we really baked it into uh, the model. Wow, oh, terrific. Thank you for describing that. I heard a few really interesting things. One, that you included the Housing First language in the in the contract with the state, that you included it in the RFP language with your future and anticipated subrecipients, and that you're also already thinking about monitoring and evaluation and how to follow up and, and make sure your your subrecipients are, are really following a Housing First model. And it sounds like you're providing that education, so it'll be a, a supportive process. Um, I'd like to switch gears a little bit and and hear a little bit about what challenges you've experienced related to Housing First in your work, or maybe since um, this housing initiative is getting kicked off the ground, what challenges you might anticipate uh, coming up and how you plan on mitigating those challenges? We'll start with Michelle. So thus far, because we're in the infancy of the project, we haven't... Um really dealt with any issues with the Housing First model. Aside from Philadelphia's infrastructure, um, there's very limited, there's no low barrier rent in the city. And then there are a lot of shelters that are closing because of their lack of upkeep and repair. So we are now in the process of recruiting landlords, um, looking to see who would be interested in this project that we're doing, um, the reason why we're doing it. And we hope to have a uh, sort of like a, a panel so to speak, of the landlords, so we can fully communicate what it is we're trying to do, why it's important, and how they can help by being a part of it. Um, currently, our new program is recruiting those people. We're actually putting flyers in central intake um, locations for people who are living in shelter yeah. so that they have access to the information and they can come anonymously they can contact because the um, flyer doesn't identify that they specifically are living with HIV, but if they are, there's a phone number that they can actually call to get more information and um, or if they have medical case management already. So our challenge is right at this point are very limited. It was just so much we're still um, in a planning phase and trying to put things in perspective um, by looking at the anticipated barriers that may come along and putting a response into those along the way. Yeah, great. Thank you. Anna? I will say that we do have the challenge that every jurisdiction has um, is that's around stigma and fear. Um, there's, a, you know, in, in Philadelphia, we have a significant and deep um, crisis among people who inject drugs um, and people who use drugs. Um, we, you know, regularly make the national news around around this crisis and um uh there's uh there's a you know sort of a developed sentiment around uh not in my backyard not in my neighborhood um and there's a lot of fear of people fearing that an individual who has had that experience who has been um on the streets would not make a good neighbor would not be a safe neighbor um and we really want to you know we're really working hard to combat that that um that you know people deserve a second chance and they deserve a healthy life and a safe place to live. And they deserve more than second chances. They deserve as many chances as it takes. Um, and But it's hard because there's a lot of fear and uh, sensationalized reporting and stigma. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Anna. Um, switching gears a little bit, could you tell us about how you anticipate monitoring housing first? You know how how do you know it's happening um, in in the programs that you're funding to do this work? So currently, what I'm developing is a guideline manual for the subrecipient, so they understand the different uh, components of what Housing First is, what radical customer service is, and how HOPWA actually works, termination requirements, so forth and so on, so that they have a a reference, so to speak, to look back on. We will also once in gear, meet with them periodically to talk about any barriers or challenges they may be having and just to support them knowing that we're there to discuss it and to um, they can identify their accomplishments also so that we can applaud them for doing well 
thus far and be there for support if they need it. Terrific. So it sounds like really a supportive collaborative process to, to help build the capacity of your of your sub recipients. Terrific. We also do have a couple of ways that a um, that a client could um, could reach out. Uh, we do have a health information helpline that has a complaint capacity. Um, and in, if an individual is sort of not experiencing things as advertised, they can reach out um, to our uh, health information helpline. They can get um, uh, and that can be we can work to address um, anything that is coming up. I do want to note that sometimes there's a misunderstanding about what housing first means. Um, we we had this really great session um, around aging with HIV and we had a housing session during it. And one of the participants um, got up and talked about um uh, you know, having having experienced homelessness, need, wanting to, needing an apartment, wanting to be in an apartment, and being um, frustrated and upset that they um, that what they were first offered was a, a shelter a spot. Um, and you know, we want to note that housing first doesn't mean how permanent housing is the first place you go into. Um, there are um, while they while we will not have. Um, um, Bar barriers to entry based on um, uh, characteristics of a person that there are some logistical uh, reasons why a person might be in shelter or in a short term or transitional situation before they before they may get to uh, permanent housing. And just to piggyback real quick on what you said, Anna, the um, we're pretty much focused on equity as opposed to equality. So it may not be um, the first place that you may go would may be a shelter. It's a transitional, the shelter is considered transitional housing. And during that time, we will be looking for the permanent housing for you and allow you to do whatever it is that you may need to make sure that once you receive it, then you're able to sustain what you've received. Oh, terrific. Thanks for clarifying that point. I think that's that's helpful to hear, uh, to hear that housing first means it's a a stable place to live while vulnerable people are being navigated to more stable housing. And we recognize that that process can take a, a while. And we heard from Anna that you're in the, in the new contract, it's, you're not going to be kicking anyone out after 24 months. So we recognize that this can be a, a lengthy process and some people require more time and more supports to get them to that stable housing and other people might be less time and, and fewer supports. It sort of depends on, on the individual. Um, before we hear from Phoebe, what tips do you have for other jurisdictions that want to accomplish similar work or maybe thinking about um, about housing and, and housing first in their jurisdictions and their communities? Well, I would say would look at the, the entire picture as opposed to the right, left or center of the picture. View the whole picture of what it is that you're actually trying to accomplish. Um, you have a plan of action, develop team leaders. Um, and focus on concerns, probabilities, and solutions to those problems so that you can minimize things before the project begins. Um, focus on your target audience. Who, who are you trying to actually engage? Um, utilize city government, if possible, to assist you. Ex anticipate those challenges. Um, then remember that Housing First is not just about housing. You know, there are other caveats that go along with it. And then be prepared to um, by that time, when you're writing your RFP, all of those variables have been put in their proper perspective, for lack of a better word, and then it the process will flow much easier because you're not constantly putting out a fire or trying to find a solution while you're doing this. Mm -hmm. Terrific. So really anticipating, thinking ahead. Go ahead, Anna. Why don't you add? I would also say, you know, just to elaborate on that, like identify your thought and action partners. Um, so in the city of Philadelphia, we have the Office of Homeless Services. We have uh, DHCD, which is the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, we have um, programs that, uh, that that do provide housing. And uh, really, it's about lever finding out what's there, what the issues are, what the barriers are, and, um, you know, talking talking with the people who are doing the work about uh, about what the issues are and what the resources are. Um, and don't assume that everyone who's not doing housing first now is is like 
assume good intention. Assume that the people who may not have housing first policies may have done things a different way in the past. Assume that they care and that they want to do good work and they want to do the best work possible by their clients and that you really need to have an, an open discussion, uh, share evidence, uh, share uh, share resources and you know be understanding about how hard this work is and what what the challenges are um, when you're talking about you know trying to nudge people into some system change that it's really not that you know there may be a resistance and it it doesn't mean they don't care it doesn't mean that they won't be partners in the future um, and you know you can really get a long way. Oh, terrific! I think that's a great sort of note to to end on about building partnerships, building your relationships. It sounds like so often people, especially in health departments or other government entities sort of operate in silos based on their funding streams. And so bridging those bridging those gaps so you can collaborate um, and coordinate resources that are available to, in, to different programs and to different groups of people is so important. So thanks Anna and Michelle um, so much for sharing. And I'm sure we'll have some questions from the audience for you momentarily. Um, but I'd love to turn the floor to Phoebe now. Um, and Phoebe, since you're at a, you are at a community-based organization, can you tell us a little bit more about how Claire Housing is implementing a housing first approach? Yeah, for sure. So our focus now um, is really on ending homelessness for people living with HIV. And to do that, we've we've always had a housing first model. Um, and we still have that. We're still pushing ourselves to figure out ways to eliminate barriers that come with the system. Um, so our housing is all subsidized. We have some units have better subsidies than others, um, but it's essential for us that there is a subsidized rent payment so that we can serve people with zero income or with extremely low income coming out of homelessness. Um, the other key part of our work is that we have 24 seven services embedded in all of our buildings um, that is voluntary people don't have to participate but that person is there if they want to engage um, and then each site also has a, a support services manager who is attempting to build relationships and support every resident coming in with whatever goals they have so uh, we're really working with wherever they're at. If they want to address substance use, then we're we'll, we're working on that. If they don't, then that's okay. We will work on housing stability um, and hopefully, you know, accessing food and clothing and things. Um, and then if they're ready, we will engage on other goals like substance use, mental health, employment, education. So we really want to get people into housing. It's their own unit. It's a private rental. Uh, we help with all the paperwork that goes to the county or the city or the state, all of the paperwork. Um, and then we just try to build relationships. Okay. Yeah. So building those relationships sounds like um, thinking about the whole person, letting the person set their goals and guide, guide where they want to focus on first um, and not, not sort of putting these preconditions or, um, you know, the program goals upon the person and, and having that sort of collaborative relationship sounds really important. Um, yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about what challenges uh, you and Claire Housing experience and how do you mitigate these challenges? Yeah, so our, I mean, one of our biggest challenges really is that we have far more need than we do housing. Um, so we have about 300 uh, people that we're serving in the metro area, and we have about 450 on our wait list. And so those are people living with HIV who are either currently homeless or are unstably housed. Um, so to mitigate that, it's always a balance of trying to be, you know, ensure that you're stable enough currently to keep operating and to grow and find new opportunities for housing. So we are pursuing multiple options at once um, because many of them will will dead end and we can't get that housing done but hopefully some of those uh, housing options will come to fruition so we can serve more people because we are permanent housing people don't tend to leave they once they get stable and uh, get to know their neighbors and feel comfortable then they stay so that's one issue another issue we deal with um, and definitely see an increase in the complexity of the clients that we're serving because of the intertwining of drug use, mental illness, 
long histories of trauma, um, major public safety issues in our community. Um, we see it, it's become uh, more difficult in some cases to keep everybody housed because of some of the um, damages, property damages, or threats of violence that can be exacerbated with untreated mental health and active substance use, which is just so prevalent and so cheap and accessible. Um, and so we see we see so much trauma that sometimes uh, we can barely scratch the surface. To mitigate that, we're trying to um, change our model to be more intensive and off be sort of more aggressively providing services. We were very much, you know, voluntary. People are coming and taking from us what they need, but we're really trying to up the level of engagement um, by being more actively, you know, knocking on doors, checking on people, seeing how they're doing today, and not as passively waiting for people to come down to us. We're right in the front lobby. So we see everybody when they come and go, which is a really great touch point. Um, but we're sort of saying, how can we take that up a notch and uh, really try to get to know what a client needs before it's too late? So mm -hmm. we're working on working on that through added, we're adding some mental health supports, but also trying to change our, our entry model so that we have a more intensive plan within the first 90 days. Whereas we used to be really building that relationship in the first year or two before we could get really um, down in the details, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, thank you. So you talked about support needed first for more housing in general, which I imagine many people on this webinar feel in their in their communities. Um, and you also described the increase in complexity of people receiving services at Claire Housing, specifically uh, mental health uh, mental health needs. What support would you like from a health department to help you advance your work and specifically to help you advance your housing first model? Yeah, um, we are, so Minneapolis is going through, we're in the midst of a public health declared HIV outbreak um, related to intravenous drug use and encampments. And I think we really have pushed for more support from our public health department on education, materials, and resources, because people impacted by this outbreak often don't know that it's going on. Um, the outbreak was declared in, I think, April of 2020, which was kind of a hot time for COVID. <laughs> um, so a lot of it's, so we're still in the midst of it and we still don't see a lot of information. So that's very like health education oriented. The other piece is around services. So while we have subsidized housing units, we struggle to find funding for the services, which I think are so crucial to the actual ongoing stability of our residents. Um, and we would love additional support either in direct funding or in collaborating around health and chronic health conditions that allows us to bring in higher levels of staffing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. You So you mentioned that Minneapolis is currently experiencing an outbreak of uh, HIV among people who use um, intravenous drugs and who are staying in encampments. Could you just tell us a little bit more about how, how Housing First might help address this outbreak um, amongst this priority population? Yeah, for sure. And a lot of this is you know, you can go back to what Ginny explained about housing first and the impact that it has. Um, but we know that when people are stably housed, they are much more likely to be accessing medical care and following treatment that uh, including HIV treatment. So when people move into housing at Claire within one year, 90% of our tenants are undetectable in their HIV load, meaning Obviously, the chances of passing that to others are zero, if any. Um, so 90%, if we could house people that were currently living outside, unsheltered, in encampments, we believe that we could get to 90%. We could get to higher if we had even more services, I think, in place. Um, but what's really interesting to us is that while we have people who are using intravenous drugs in our units, 
Um, we have about 60% of our tenants um, that are active drug users. And despite that, they still have the same levels of undetectable HIV viral load. So given the tools, given the housing, given the stability and safety, uh, they also care about their health. They want to be undetectable. They want to be healthy long-term. And we just need, it, you, it's so hard to take medications every day if you don't know where you're going to be sleeping. It's just not the top of mind. Um, so we think that housing as an intervention to this current HIV outbreak is just foundational. Like we can do all the testing and treatment in encampments all day long and that hopefully will make a difference. But without housing, there's no way people can stabilize their health. Yeah, wow, thank you. I, I think that is such a powerful note to pause on and, and brings us back to really why we're here today about how housing and housing first is such a core component of ending the HIV epidemic and that it's possible and housing and housing first is such a key part of getting there. Um, so I'd love to um, pause and see any questions for, that you may have for the audience as to the panelists for housing works about we've sh what we've shared today, our EDC one that's come through the question and answer chat. So feel free to answer them. Excuse me, feel free to put them in that Q&A um, box and we'll answer them one at a time. Um, so the first question I see is from Raju in, at Austin Public Health in Texas. Um, we're planning on funding EHG housing to one of our providers soon, so that's terrific. Um, since we are new to EHG housing, do you have any recommendations about the outcomes or performance measures for EHG housing we can focus on? Can outcome measures be the same as in Part A housing, specifically for data collection purposes? So I'm first gonna, I think, turn the floor over to Housing Works uh, if they would like to answer that question, and then the panelists are are welcome to chime in as well. Eliza, I don't know if you're familiar with the, if Eliza's with us, she's our QA person, familiar with the uh, Part A reporting requirements. I can tell you that HRSA is very interested in looking at outcomes of EHG housing. And in our first learning collaborative, the kind of metrics that we looked at were uh, engagement in care. Last time you saw your primary care doctor and got a lab, viral load suppression. Um, and then uh, we were also interested in who is being served by your program? What are the basic demographics? Are you reaching the priority populations in your community? And then eventually, when someone is discharged from the program, similar to HOPWA, what was the reason for leaving? Uh, was it a good outcome um, or was it a discharge? Um, was it mutually agreed or... Um, you know, what steps were documented to try to prevent that return to homelessness, homelessness if it was a bad outcome. So I called on Elisa and then I answered the question myself, but go ahead, Elisa, if you have something to add. Terrific, or if one of the panelists, um, Anna, Phoebe, Michelle, if one of you would like to add something to that, um, to Ginny's response, then please, you're welcome to. I can, um, just from an internal, quality perspective, we measure length of time housed and find that really meaningful so that we can hone in on if if the housing is actually working for people or not. And we do that by site and overall. So we know that within each of our um, housing apartments, we have tenants that have moved in the day it opened that are still with us, for example. So we are we always are tracking also on the housing stability in addition to detectability and um, engagement in care, but. I'm going to drop into the chat, the items that we uh, we put into our housing RFP. Um, so um, uh, we are, um, uh, for the transitional housing program, we would measure linkage to transitional housing services through the program. Um, retention and transitional housing services through the program until permanently housed, placement in um, a, uh, 
placement and permanent housing. And then we have some uh, you know, medical case management type measures that include prescription of ART, um, adherence has assessment and counseling, accompanied medical visits, retention and medical care, viral suppression, um, retention in housing medical case management until uh, permanently housed. And I'll drop that uh, in the chat. Oh, terrific. Thank you for sharing that. And especially for those of us who are, um, you know, who are visual learners, I think that's helpful to see that and also to have a record of that so we can, we can take notes. Terrific. Thank you. Um, so our next question um, is that Housing First is often talked about um, as, uh, in Housing First, how, um, substance use is often meant described as a barrier to housing. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what some other barriers people face are and what are some of the strategies to help get folks with these other barriers into housing? Um, so again, I think I'll start with Housing Works. Um, if you wanna, if you wanna chime in, and then Phoebe and Anna, you can you can add to it. Did you want to take this one, Ken? Yeah, I can jump in here a little bit. Anyway, uh, I would say first of all that that um, substance use in my mind is a, is a perceived barrier. It's really not a barrier. Uh, substance use for many, many people, just exactly like Jenny said, is, is a fact of life. And it's just the question of them learning how to have, you know, a healthy, good life uh, and manage it uh, in a, in, from a harm reduction perspective. Um, some other barriers or perceived barriers I can think of is like, uh, well, like Michelle alluded to earlier, stuff like, you know, she said she was had to work with somebody that had a, um, arson on their record. Uh, sometimes uh, with different landlords, there are other uh, things that could be, you know, uh, a, some kind of abuse conviction. It could be, uh, you know, other legal matters, that sort of stuff. And almost always, if you pull the right people onto the team, sometimes you have to bring in the funder because uh, often the funders are government people. Uh, my experience has been you, you'll always get them in. It just takes some work uh, to get them in. Um, one other thing I'll say while, while I have the floor that may be a little bit off directly of this, but um, I think it's really, really important to say, you know, we've had this opportunity, this really cool opportunity to, to talk to people coast to coast now for I don't know how long, a year and a half, almost two years about uh, uh, EHE and, uh, and housing as an intervention for HIV care and housing first and housing first and harm reduction is definitely, you know, in my retirement and my old age, one of my passions. And uh, I think it's important to say though that what we've seen is that people often very well intend people, people that want to do the right thing and do the good work, but the support structures almost always are not there to monitor and enforce housing works policies. People often take a laissez-faire attitude, it seems like, about housing, uh, housing first. Housing first is a distinct um, model that has to be, has to be monitored. And, and, and um, you know, and that's where clinical supervision uh, comes in and why it's so important. Uh, you know, there could be other methods you use just to make sure that people are doing it right. Um, and, and this thing, you know, I've seen it happen at Housing Works for all the years I was there that um, you have to continue to do it because the turnover and new staff that come in with different ideas. I'll never forget, you know, I've, I've, I've encountered a few times people literally thought housing first and harm reduction was just the way to, in quotes, trick people. <laughs> To get them to abstinence, you know, and that's certainly not what it is. So it it is a it is a distinct clinical technical model that has to be very carefully and properly implemented, and it has to be monitored and enforced. Terrific, thanks, Ken. And I think that's helpful to to hear to hear that model sort of reinforced about it's not just the housing; it's housing with wraparound support services that are continuously offered. So, so thank you for, for sharing that. Um, Phoebe, did you want to add about um, some barriers that people mm -hmm. face beyond substance use and, and some yeah. strategies? For sure. Yeah, we these are all just 
um, jotted down some thoughts because all of these have happened with our prospective residents in the last probably quarter. Um, but we see criminal histories are a big one. And so especially if there is um, a sexual offense that prohibits, you know, distance from a child care center or something like that. Um, some of our buildings have families with children under 18, some don't. So we're sometimes able to navigate that. Um, also, we see this is interesting too, but a fear and a loss of community. So when people are coming to us out of an encampment situation, we've had this, we've had the case where they've just left the next day because they don't have the people around them they're used to. They don't, we had a specific person I'm thinking of who was really concerned about someone else in the encampment and felt like if he wasn't in the encampment to keep her safe, she wasn't going to be safe. So he abandoned the housing um, for that reason. We also have income, of course, and family structure. So we'll work with a parent who's trying to regain custody of a child, but they only are eligible for a single, you know, for a uh, efficiency because they're not in custody of the child. So they don't want to take that unit, which would restrict their ability down the road to, to get that child back. There's all kinds of stuff with, with that related to family structure and what people are looking for. Um, and then we also have, we just had someone who missed their we tried many times to let get the property management company, this is for one we don't own, um, to meet with her, but she was fleeing domestic violence and was out of the state during the enrollment. Um, and we couldn't get her, they, they couldn't, they wouldn't waive the, um, like the fact that she had missed the appointments. So that's why we like to control the housing because we can waive that, we can accommodate. Um, and then also physical, just physical uh, disabilities that do get in the way of some of our units are not accessible. They're built, you know, hundred years ago. And so we have to find an opening or a unit that is accessible in some cases, that means they have to wait or can't come into housing. Those are just like things I can think of off the, oh, we also do see mental health and some paranoia around, like, if you're offering me this unit, are you going to take all my money? Are you going to be spying on me in the unit because you own it? Are there cameras everywhere? Um, so the mental health piece can also be a barrier. And one thing you said, Phoebe, about community, um, often people who are um, unsheltered or, you know, they don't have a sense of community, you know, just the people that they live around. So it could be a very scary thing moving away from what you're used to and 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 shelter that's why we try to make it so inclusive and build a new type of community so that you can have some um people who are on the same page that you're on have dealt with the same things you're dealing and then you get to see them change so you can say myself well and maybe I can do it too. And then when we move them out, we try to make sure we send at least two or three in the same direction so that they wouldn't be isolated with someone living in West Philly and then someone they know that they've been in shelter with for maybe six or seven months or even a year sometimes and they're in South Philly. So mm -hmm. we try to move people in clusters so that they would have that support from someone they actually knew and didn't go back into that isolation and uh, lack of community. That's so awesome. I mean, people... Yeah, we all get value from our community. And even if it's just the person you live with in your own house, like one of you takes out the trash, one of you does the dishes, whatever that is, but you're bringing value. And I think that's what we see totally that people form those relationships and they give meaning to their day. And um, yeah, that's awesome. And maybe a way to bring this together is to think of trying to keep barriers low as at, at the very least, not imposing barriers as program requirements that add on to these barriers that people already uh, are facing because of their life trajectories or so you're trying to overcome those work with them to overcome those barriers, but at least not piling on new barriers uh, that they have to that they have to meet. Perfect. Thank you all very much for, for sharing and reflecting. I know it sounds like um, it can be very complicated, but the sort of individual case management relationships with, with each person um, that you're engaging is so important. 
and and sort of tailoring each each approach. So there's no one one size fits all when thinking about housing and and housing support services. Um, I want to acknowledge that we have some other questions that have come in the chat. So I think for the sake of timing, we're going to save those for the maybe for the very end if we have more time. And we'll certainly um, email you some responses for those of you who have added in more questions. So don't worry, you can still feel free to add more questions in, um, and we'll we'll email you and make sure that you have the the information that you're that you're looking for. Um, and so now I'm going to turn it over to Alice to talk about some next steps. Uh, if you're interested in in this housing work. Thank you, Margaret. And thank you to our panelists again, Michelle, Anna, and Phoebe. It was so inspiring to hear about all of your fantastic work. So yes, as, as Margaret indicated, we're gonna take a few minutes to discuss our um, TEP and Housing as Healthcare Learning Community and invite you all to join our second cohort of this innovative learning community. So from December of 2021 through May of 2023, CAI facilitated um, the HRSA funded, eight HRSA funded EHE jurisdictions to come together um, in a learning community focused on housing for people living with HIV as part of their strategy to end the HIV epidemic. Through peer learning and individualized TA, TA, this learning community allowed the participating jurisdictions to think about the practical application of the housing first model in their jurisdiction, amongst many other activities. Here we have representatives on the screen from the participating teams at one of our two, per, two um, day in-person meetings. And this one took place at the Denver office, the CA office in Denver, excuse me, where I am currently. And just to reinforce, the goal of this um, learning community it was to dramatically improve outcomes for people living with HIV, experiencing homelessness or housing instability by leveraging and aligning existing and new resources through a housing strategy that expands access to a broader range of housing opportunities. And to achieve that goal, we took these participants over the course of those 16 months through a process in which they were able to first accurately assess um, and describe the extent and nature of the housing needs within their community, also to understand the current um, inventory of existing programs and supportive housing programs to meet the needs um, within their community, develop and strengthen relationship and com with community partners and other stakeholders um, that were all working within this sphere, and using that information gathered, we helped them in developing a robust housing strategy um, that will guide them in thinking through a, a, a jurisdiction-wide house a plan for housing within their community. So when jurisdictions emerged this, this last spring, um, they had really had the knowledge and skills as well as some of those practical examples that Margaret mentioned earlier to really propel um, the housing first model within their communities. So if we go to the next slide, you can see the learning community implementation process. Um, after the folks were uh, selected into this learning community, um, we held an orientation webinar and really encouraged these folks to form implementation teams that brought together folks from across their jurisdictions to do this work together. Um, after they did so, we engaged them in a series of activities over the course of the next uh, year, including virtual and in-person learning sessions, shorter action period webinars where folks were able to share out their, their key progress, and then individualized TA that supported them um, to implement and individualize these plans for their unique communities. Um, and then we are currently in the closeout and continued support phase, so providing as-needed technical assistance to help folks continue to propel their strategies participating in dissemination opportunities like today's webinar and last week, at, uh, two weeks ago at USCHA, and then ongoing community um, and uh, creating and fostering this ongoing community of, net, of passionate colleagues um, in the EHE world. And so we invite you to join us for cohort two of the Housing as Healthcare Learning Community. This is an opportunity to come together with peers from across the country and learn more about strengthening your approach for housing with people for people living with HIV. This learning community embraces the all teach, all learn model. So it'll be a fun year of interactive learning, activities and diving deep into various topics with experts in the field, leadership and housing organizations from our communities and each other. 
We are looking for jurisdictions or states that are really invested in making a difference in addressing homelessness for people living with HIV and who also see housing in as, as an essential part of ending the HIV epidemic. Um, just to provide a brief overview, the goal for the second cohort of housing is healthcare learning community is to reduce new HIV infections by 90% by 2030 by increasing housing opportunities for people with HIV by strate strategically building and maintaining partnerships through ending the HIV and Ryan White um, program funds, HAPWA and continuum of care programs. So this learning community is really going to be focused on that relationship building and how partnerships can play such a vital role in addressing homelessness for people living with HIV. If this sounds like something your jurisdiction, state, or team could be a good fit for, we really would love for you to go to our website and learn more. And if, if it's so inclined, fill out an application. Uh, the Housing as Healthcare Learning Community is approximately going to be a 13-month commitment. It's set to begin um, at the begin end of November 2023 and end in February of 2025. Um, we would love to answer any questions that you might have, so please reach out to us individually. Applications are due September 30th, um, and so we really hope to hear from you soon and look forward to hearing your applications. If you have any questions about that, I can pause now. Um, and I also know that we want to uh, maybe make time for the question from the chat. Any questions, Janae, aside from the one we didn't have time for? Or Margaret? Um, I think we can go ahead and maybe and maybe answer the question from earlier. Um, so Ginny and Kenneth Housing Works and the panelists, um, feel free to, to, to consider and then weigh in on this. So someone had asked, are there any models that follow a housing first approach, but after individuals are placed, they are later required to engage in other treatment. So for example, substance use or mental health treatment if needed. For example, if a person with HIV is first placed and then say after six to one year of housing, are they required to receive other necessary treatment? Um, so maybe I'll start by turning the floor to Housing Works if, if one of you would like to um, take a first answer to this. Well, I can't believe Ken didn't jump on that one, but um... Uh, no, that would that would not be a housing first approach. I mean, uh, you would you might encourage that person. You might work with them over a course of months through motivational interviewing to help them identify their own goals around treatment for substance use or mental health. And then I'll pass it to Ken because I I know that in some cases where behavior becomes um, threatening to the person or to others, you might enter into a behavioral contract, but I'll, I'll turn over to Ken for that. But not simply because you have a therapeutic goal that's not shared by the client. Yeah, and what came to mind uh, when I heard the question was that there may be the rare scenarios because of criminal justice involvement, somebody on probation or parole, doesn't happen too much in New York or in New York City, but I know it happens in other jurisdictions where they may require uh, abstinence or treatment because of what they would call, in quotes, a relapse or something like that. So that's totally out of the control of the client. So you would still work with them and do your best to stick with a harm reduction model and also maybe do your best to work with the authorities that they're dealing with to uh, ease them out of that situation if that's possible. Um, so there are those rare occasions where that could happen, but that being said, you know, totally um, um, echo and reinforce what Jenny just said. But Ken, wouldn't you agree that if someone's use became a threat to their stability in the housing, that's, a, a, that's an event where you would really engage actively with that client? <laughs> Yeah. But there, I think it may seem like semantics, but there, the goal is to keep the housing safe and to keep the person safe, not to, it, it, it's not necessarily a therapeutic goal. It's a goal about reducing right. harm for what's happening. 
And, and maybe to elaborate a little bit on Jenny mentioned behavioral contracts, you know, we, you know, do and have utilized those on some occasions when things got really, really tough, where people seem to be a danger to themselves or others, especially you have other residents, you know, telling you that they fear for their safety because of their resident. Um, the, 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 those behavioral contracts are used, the intention or the goal of those contracts isn't to lead to eviction. It's to, you know, bring the person in and stabilize them. And my experience, again, over almost 20 years is that that almost always works. Uh, some rare exceptions. I can think of, you know, I could count on one hand, uh, but, but that almost always works. Because it's done in a compassionate and supportive way. It's not punitive. Because um, no matter what somebody's going through, unless it's some extreme mental health, health issues, uh, they want to keep their housing. You know, they almost always, so you can find that sweet spot where they're motivated to keep their housing. Mm, terrific. So thanks. Thanks, Jenny and Ken. So it really sounds like the housing first model does not at any point require people participate in specific treatment services, though they certainly, case managers and other staff certainly work with individuals um, around that, around harm reduction and around different different goals that the client has. Uh, but it sounds like safety of both the residents and, uh, and the individual and other residents is, is a key consideration. And there would be behavioral contracts or other interventions to, to ensure safety. Um, so, so thank you. Um, I think I'm going to, now that we're towards the end of our event, I'm going to turn the floor over to William um, to, to conclude the event. So go ahead, William. <laughs> thank you. As I mentioned, I'm William Bland, Deputy Director of the TAP-IN Program. And, uh, and yeah, I just want to thank all our panelists for a very engaging conversation that we had today to talk more about, about housing as healthcare, to learn about Housing First. We've got great partners with Housing Works, and it's so great to hear from the jurisdictions and the actual work. So it's been an amazing conversation that we've had. Um, as a, And to wrap up, just to talk about what TAP-IN can do for you, because this is all part of the CAI organization and the TAP-IN program. So we can assist you if you're in an EHE jurisdiction. We provide on-demand technical assistance. We help you develop jurisdictional TA plan. And thank you, Janae, for tap so putting in those resources. Uh, and as you can see, we also have access to a number of TA providers and partners. We can set up peer-to-peer -peer sessions, as we've talked about. Uh, Margaret and Alice talked about. We've had our learning cohort already, our learning collaborative. So we can put you in touch with some of those jurisdictions and we invite you to apply for the upcoming learning collaborative. Next slide. And so basically you can request it. You can go to Target HIV where we have a lot of resources where we have been doing webinars such as this on other various topics and, and, and again, some more information on housing. And you can always just drop us a line and send us an email at tapin at caiglobal.org. So I just want to thank you so much for your time and attention today. And I think I now turn it back over to Brooke. Yes, thank you, William. Thank you, everyone. Um, I know we're right at the end of time. So we just want to thank you for your attendance and engagement. Um, on your way out, um, please do go ahead and click our evaluation link in the chat. If you do not see your name on the list, you will need to register for today's webinar. So please register so we can send you that evaluation via email. Um, so once you click the link, um, you'll see your name in the list. Just type your name in the search box at the very top um, and your name should pop up and you'll be able to complete our evaluation. So we value your feedback um, if you can't tell. So we do want to hear from you. Um, and thank you all so much for, for your questions and for your patience today. So we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Take care, everyone.